Good morning, everyone. I'd like to welcome everybody that's here in the auditorium, as well as to those that are here on the Zoom platform. And before we do anything, let's go to our Heavenly Father in prayer before we enter into a study of his word. Let us pray. Our most gracious and heavenly Father, it's once again that we come before you, Heavenly Father, and this being another one of your days, Heavenly Father, the Lord's day, the first day of the week. Please bless us here at the Church of Christ at Meets in Miami Gardens as we venture into Bible study of the book of Ephesians, Heavenly Father. We're still in chapter one. Please guide us in our understanding. May we extrapolate everything that we can to help us be those Christians that you called us to be and those, and those ambassadors of your son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we do pray and ask it all. Amen. Once again, as we go through the lesson, if you have any questions, please raise your hand or put it in the chat. I just ask that you keep your questions relevant to the lesson for time's sake. If you have just a general question, you can get with me at any time. If you have your Bibles, open it up to Ephesians chapter 1. And we're down to chapter, I mean, we're down to verse number 9. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 9. I will be asking questions as we go through this. Here the Apostle Paul says, having made known unto us that us is the church, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, that's God's will, according to his good pleasure, which he had purposed in himself. The first question I have for you, what do we mean by mystery? What do we mean by mystery? Charles, what do you think? Say again. Something that's not revealed. You're, you're on the right track. What else does mystery mean? And I'm eventually going to take you to the Koine Greek specific definition. What is meant by mystery? If we think about mystery right now, what do we think of? Let's just say if I gave my brother a map. And it said, this is a mystery to find one million golden coins dug somewhere in the ground. Would, would that imply that I'm going to reveal it to him? No, sister account. Some, it's something hidden. But it's what specifically? You guys are on the, on the right track. It's like a hidden secret. You're on the right track. But what did God through the Holy Spirit say he was going to do? To it for us. Remember having made known. In this context. The hidden secret was made known to Christians. And it said it was purposed in him. What is that secret talking about? Think about the Old Testament. And in the, in the beginning of Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. And then what eventually changed as we got into Acts. What was that hidden secret? Yes, sir. Um, that it, out, of, out of the two nations, he would create one. Two nations being? Uh, the nation of Israel and Gentiles. That's exactly right. The hidden secret, he was going to make one fold. Then we say, if you have your Bibles, go to John. I think it's chapter 10. The denominational world teach this is talking about other denominations, but there were no denominations during that time. So it can't be that. I'll tell you what the scriptures say. Go to John 10. I hope I got the right verse. Let's see here. Could be around verse 16 if my memory serves me right. Yep. Listen to this, John 10 and 16. And other sheep, what does Jesus mean by sheep? Charles. That's right, his followers, God's people. Now he's saying he, he has other, who do they have right now? Brother David. That's right, the nation of Israel. So now he's saying there's gonna be something else. And other sheep, I have, which are not of this fold, meaning the Israelite fold. Them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, 
and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. That's what that great mystery was. The Gentiles would have the same equal access. I said, I said Israel, I said the Gentiles would have the same equal access as the nation of Israel. Can we say hallelujah to that? Mm -hmm. That was considered a ministry, a, a mystery, but it was revealed to us. In verse number 10, it says that in the dispensation of the fullness of time, he might gather to, together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. This is talking about the ultimate gathering together. First of all, what's a dispensation? That's one of those funny big words. What is that, David? That's right. I like to take a little bit of time to shed some light on that, too. What was the first dispensation? Charles, what was the first one? Patriarch. The patriarch. In other words, God dealt with who? The head of the households, right? Did that give us, you know, the light in scripture is often some a metaphor for his wisdom. Did God give us some light under the patriarchs? Yes, he did. I remember a scholar one time said he gave us some starlight. Do stars give light at night? They're reflecting. They don't give a lot, but they give a little bit of light, right? And that's exactly what the patriarchal dispensation did. Then God went a little further. After the patriarchal, what did he give us? Yes, Charles. The mosaical or the law of Moses. Did that give us a little bit more light? Yes, it did. A lot of scholars call it, it gave us moonlight. Moonlight gave us more than the, than the patriarchal. And then now we're in the which one? No, we're past the messianic now. What are we in now? Yes, this account. The Christian age or what we call the sunlight. And so when it's amazing, that gives us the most light, doesn't it? And you know what's amazing when we said the moonlight and the starlight? Do you know where they get their, their light from? It's from the sun. If you study astronomy, they ultimately get their light from the sun. Isn't that a great connection, metaphor for where it, it all comes from the sun anyway? But we are in the, the sunlight dispensation. Of the, people call it the church dispensation or Christian dispensation. Will there be another? Not according to scripture. We are in the last days that started at the resurrection of Christ. Now this is saying, verse 10 is letting us know when all shall be brought together. What's, what's going to happen on, the, on the, the second coming of Christ Jesus? Anything going to happen? Yeah, the dead in Christ shall rise first. Now it says first as compared to who? What well, the dead are Christians too. It's compared to those of us that are Christians that are still alive. Well, guys, follow me. And we're going to do what? Just say, oh, we're saved. What does the Bible say we're going to do? Yes, it's the account. We're going to meet who in the air? We're going to meet who in the air? Going to meet Christ Jesus in the air? What's going to happen to this planet according to Second Peter? Say again. It's going to be burned up. Bible says with fervent heat. It even says the earth and the elements that are therein. You know that's some serious heat when you say elements are going to burn. Sister Van Cole, yes. That's, that's a whole nother lesson. That's in Revelation. And that 1,000 years is not to be taken literally. It's metaphorically for just a set period, like a dispensation. So, absolutely. It's a set period that God is going to deal with this earth. Yes, ma'am. Say again. Well, it, it, the patriarchal period, yeah, it was prior to the law of Moses. Yeah, prior to the law of Moses. That's right. 
Okay. Not necessarily directly with Noah, it's with the head of the household from Noah onward up until Moses. One more time. Yes, that were head of households. Make sense? All right. God deals with us through the dispensations, the fullness of time. Do we want to make it to the ultimate fullness of time? Yes, we do. Because like I said, the Bible says the earth and all that is therein shall be burned up. What's going to be left over? No. Bible says Christians will be taken away. His words will still exist, though. And then from there is a whole another deep lesson that hopefully one day we can get into with Revelation. Bottom line, you want a crash course on Revelation right now? In 10 seconds? Don't get caught up in the dragons and the beasts and all that. All you have to be caught up in is making sure you're saved. If you're making sure you're saved, you have nothing to worry about. One day I'm going to go verse by verse through Revelation because I've devoted a lot of time to it. But all you have to worry about is making sure you're in Christ. That's all that matters. Trying to figure out piece by piece. Well, what is this dragon? You think the dragon is going to attack Christians? No. Of course not. That's right, Charles. Just like that. No. We should say it just like that. We want to make sure we're caught up in Christ. Did I see a hand? David. That's right. I remember a Gail used to have a saying that I used to love to hear him say. He said, if you're worried if we're going to win, just read the, the end of the book. <laughs> and you see, to be victorious, you have to be in the victor. And the victor is Christ. And Christ has all victory. That's why we're called to be more than conquerors. We're supposed to rock around because we have the victory. You see all kind of parallels to that in the book of Joshua. He told Joshua, imagine if you were going into a battle. I'm familiar with battle. Imagine going into battle and the general told you, no matter where you step your foot, you're going to have victory. As long as you meditate on my word. Don't you think I'd be in this word day and night? That's what he promised Joshua. People say, well, he didn't promise us that. Yes, he did. He said, all things work together for the good for those who are what? Call, love him that are called according to his purpose. So just reading that scripture, why wouldn't we be relentless about his purpose? In my life as a minister, I have dealt with one person who struggled with that. And I said, what are you struggling with? That's a blessing for you. Well, I'm going through so much. Well, it, the Lord never said it was going to be good for your flesh. Like I like to tell you, hey, Danny, Lord never said it'd be good for your flesh. He said it'd be good for your soul. Which means all we have to do is just hang in there. And focus on his word. We're going to talk about that in the sermon today with Daniel. Daniel's a great example of that. Does that make sense? Any questions or comments before we continue? Or confusion? I don't want to confuse anybody. Okay, verse number 11 of Ephesians 1. It says, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance. Don't forget these words. Being predestined according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his will. Let's go back to this first, because you talk about this is one of the most powerful, the scriptures we're going to make, to me, is one of the most powerful blessings we have in the Bible. It says, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance. Are we familiar with an inheritance? What is that? Charles. When a person dies. That's exactly right. It's something someone gets when someone dies. Now, in the context of this, who died? Christ Jesus. What is it about this inheritance? Before you say anything, go to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Brace yourself, because first time I read this, I couldn't sit still. And how cool this is. Romans chapter 8, listen carefully as I read verse 17 slow. It says, and if children, talking about us, then heirs, that's us, right? 
heirs of God, and what does that word say? Joint heirs with Christ. Let's finish it. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. First Corinthians 10 and 13, and this scripture is the ones I go to when I'm suffering because it gives me a purpose. You see, outside of Christ, there's no real godly reason why you're suffering. You're just suffering. But at least you can get credit for it in Christ. And this says we're co-heirs. That's equal with Jesus. Oh, what a God we have. Did y'all did y'all read the same thing I read? Co-heirs with Christ. That's heavy. That's how much God thinks of his quintessential creation. You know, God created a lot of different things, but he set man at the pinnacle of it. That's why we don't have a reason to feel down for long because we have a lot to live for. Let's go back to that verse, verse number 11. It says, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance. And we saw how powerful that inheritance is, right? I mean, just think of uh, if uh, Brother Baker got a call tomorrow. And he said, hello? Yes, this is the uh, Nelson Rockefeller uh, 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 account handler. Nelson Rockefeller, I've heard of him, but I don't know Nelson Rockefeller. No, sir, you didn't, but he knew your family. And he's left you $2 billion if we looked at the interest. Do you think Brother Baker would hang the phone up? So how soon can I get to you? What do I need to bring? Birth certificate? Driver's license? Because he would see the value in that, in, that, in that inheritance. And as good as that sound, even all that money it's one day is going to be burned up. But what about co-heir with Christ? I want you to soak on that for a minute. Let it marinate. What do you think Christ has for you? And we're not talking about on this side of life. In you'll, you'll have this for eternity. You know what scripture I'm going to quote? I always quote it. I have not seen nor ear heard, neither is even entered into the heart of man, those things which God has prepared for those who love him. That means no matter how good you think it is, you haven't even scratched the surface because you're a 3D individual. We're going into a whole different level of plane. And God has something for you. That's amazing. Isn't that worth going through a few things? No matter how hard they are when you compare. You know what scripture I'm going to. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the things which God has prepared for those he loves. It says it's not even worthy to be compared. Isn't that amazing? You know, we've talked about, yes, Sister LeCount. Yes. <laughs> you know, I've heard jokes about this and it's true. You know, the things, you know, we, we've talked about the paradox down here of something like gold and how expensive gold is and how bad we want it, but it's not going to add one day to our life. And yet we can get water very, very inexpensive, but we need water every day. We need water more than we need food. And why is gold price so much higher than water? Why do we hunger after gold more than we do with water? When you read some of the scriptures in Revelation, and it, it is symbolic, but it makes a point. It says the streets are paved with gold. What do you do on the streets? You're going to walk around with a shovel and try to pluck up some gold? It's going to be that valueless. We walk on it. That's a unique perspective, isn't it? Think about that when you think about what God is going to give you as joint heir with Christ. We can only fathom so far because of the conditioning of this world. Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry, what's your name? Ka Carolina? Good to have you, Carolina. Go ahead. Say again. Uh, the purpose is his will of the Bible. We learn what God's purpose is by studying his word. You follow me? 
So whatever God would have us to do as Christians, that's his will. And we should align our lifestyle to that purpose. Does that make sense? Like you're here today in church. That's part of God's will. That's part of his purpose. You're not sitting on the beach fishing Sunday morning. You're here in church. That's a simple one, but that's a part of God's purpose. It's what he would have you to do. And how, how do we learn that? We study these books of the Bible to learn what we're supposed to do. Some people try to make that all difficult. It's just knowing God's will. And we learn God's will through studying his word. You're in the right place for that. So you're doing it. Amen. Any other questions or comments before we continue? We're going to hang with this verse for a little bit. It says, in whom also, verse 11, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance. We hit that. And we hit this earlier, but I'm going to ask again, what does this mean, being predestinated? When you go to college and take psychology, they got a whole different twist on this that's not biblical. They come from a perspective of, well, you were chosen, so you're set. Is that what that means? No. If it meant that, then what would be the need for repentance? So what do we mean by predestined? And it's amazing, you go to the Koine Greek, it makes it abundantly clear. I've created, I shared it with you all earlier, I've created a, a metaphor about it. The predestined is a vehicle. Was everybody doing Noah's time predestined to be saved? They could have been if they would have obeyed and got on the ark. You see, the, the predestined vehicle was the ark. If you got on the ark, you were predestined to be saved. As long as, you, as long as you were on the outside of the ark, you weren't predestined to be saved. And that goes all the way through the Bible. Now we're up to the church age. What's the ark of safety now? The church. And you get in through the gospel of Christ, right? You're predestined to be saved if you get into the ark of safety, the church of Christ. Now, can you just jump in and jump out? And when I say the church, I don't mean this building. I mean God's universal church, the church of Christ. You obey Acts 2 and 47, and he adds you to the church. As long as you stay faithful in the church, you are predestined to go to heaven. If you go halfway and say, well, no, I don't think baptism is essential, then you just got out of the predestination. It's like getting in the car and you know where it's going. If you get out of the car early, will you make your destination? No. I think I told you all last time, if I had a van, I said, as long as you're in this van, we're going to Bush Gardens to have some fun. Hop in the van. You hopped in another van that's heading south. Will you ever go to Bush Gardens at that point? No, you're heading down to the Keys at best if you don't go into the water. But the predestination is getting into the vehicle that God has ordained. Let's go back to this. In whom also we have obtained an inheritance. Here we go. Being predestined. And it's according to the purpose of him. See how that ties in? How do we learn what vehicle there is to get in? We study his will, which is in his Bible, right? We learn how to get into what's the, 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 the arc of safety now through God's word. We don't naturally know that. We have to study and come to that conclusion. It says, according to the purpose of him, who work with all things after the counsel of his own will. In other words, it's all about God and his word. Be careful with people that'll tell you, well, you know, there was some, there was some lost tribes. People try to get you with that. And if that's the case, I said, okay, that's fine. What does that have to do with my salvation? Because the person that I'm looking for is the line of the tribe of Judah. The Bible makes that clear to me. Well, you know, there was some other books, too. The Bible addresses that, too. The Bible says if, if everything that he did was written, the earth couldn't hold it. But we have what we need to be saved. Okay, and then you see, looking around, I'm like, okay, you're trying to find a reason to discredit the Bible because you can't prove your point. That's why it's so important for us to know our Bible. Everything they bring with the books and the tribes, the scriptures have already addressed. Clearly. And you know why the whole nation of Israel is so important to us today? 
Remember, go back to the, to the promise of Abraham. Was the promise of Abraham just for the nation of Israel? It said, all the earth. Go ahead, Charles. That's right, but I'm, I'm going to go a little step further than just the learning. The church has become spiritual Israel, folks, if you don't realize that. All Abraham's blessings spiritually pass on to the church. And we are called spiritual Israel. So there's a whole new Israel now. And it's not over in Tel Aviv and Jerusalem in the Middle East. Spiritual Israel is the church. It's the Christians. It's a whole new take on it now. It's not about the flesh coming up through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's about the seed that came through them, which was Christ, who made it a spiritual issue and no more an issue of lineage. Many times when Jesus was debating some of the, the Jewish heads, some of them would say, hey, they, they threw out Abraham, they threw out David. And that's why Jesus would spin it back on them. They were great people, but they weren't the Messiah. They weren't Jesus the Christ. But we have to look at as Jesus. The reason why the nation of Israel, the fleshly Israel, wanted to look at that so much is they were still hoping that uh, the, the Jesus that was coming was, was going to be a worldly leader. And he told them, my kingdom is not of this world. They were looking for a military place like Rome. Jesus was looking for a spiritual kingdom. And what was the spiritual king? The church. Daniel lets us know that no kingdom would ever come and destroy. All the kingdoms before Rome were destroyed, all the way back from Egyptians to Babylon to the Medo Persian to the Greeks to the Romans. All of those were taken out. Not this kingdom, though. No. Still here because it was not made by any man's hands. And it's a shame they missed that and they still do. It's just a tragedy because Christ came through them. You get a chance, read John. Let's read John 1. Then we're going to read John 1, 14. John chapter 1. That, may, that is John 1, 1. Then we're going to read John 1, 14. Just watch the verbiage. John chapter 1 and verse 1 reads a lot like Genesis chapter 1. It says, in the beginning, this beginning is the beginning of what? The world, really, time, everything that's within time. It says, in the beginning was the word. Is that word capital? That implies personal. That's we call it pre-incarnate Christ. It's Christ before he put on flesh. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was. That's heavy, isn't it? Now drop down to verse 14. And the word was made flesh. What did the word become when it was made flesh? Jesus, specifically Jesus the Christ. That's right. It, uh, divinity put on human flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Did they accept him though? Tragically not. Has the Lord prepared a way for them to still accept him? Yes, he has. Talk about being without excuse. Okay, let us continue. Verse 12 of Ephesians chapter 1. If you came in, we're in Ephesians 1. Now we're at verse 12. It says that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. What is that talking about? What about God the Father? But well, the first part says that we should be to the praise of his glory. 
But when it says we, it's talking about us Christians. And this, this, this word praise is getting a lot of misuse of. You know, does, does praise have guidelines? Absolutely. Somebody could come in here during our regular service with a trumpet and just um, sound like Dizzy Gillespie, Miles Davis, all put together. And it's like, wow, he sounds good. And then we said, no, you got to sit down. That's not a part of worship. You can't tell me how to praise my God. I've heard people say that. They want to bring in instrumental music into the Church of Christ. You know the problem with that is? He's, that person is caught up in entertainment, what he likes. What did God tell us to do? We always have to go back to that. Because even we even showed in the Old Testament when they used instruments, it was before they performed the sacrifice. And when they performed the sacrifice, after that, they only sang. And we, and we saw before we finished the book of Nehemiah, they called when they brought worship back in, they made sure they had the singers. And the only word is singer, 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 singer. Go to a concordance and look up singers in the book of Nehemiah. You know, it's amazing, especially after chapter 29. Or look, you could look at 2 Chronicles 29. You know, in many chapters in the, in the Old Testament, you get a piece of their Old Testament worship. You want to see an entire worship? Read 2 Chronicles 29. You see the whole thing. And you clearly see it after they were made one in, 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 in God again, then they only sang, giving a, a, a thankful offering. Yes, this is the But Well, they, they can be exclusive, but they're not. Pra praise can be done outside of worship. Like you can honor God in your life. And the Bible says, mortify the deeds of the body because it's pleasing to God. Submit yourselves daily to daily sacrifice. That's a type of phrase. It's just living towards God in the type of phrase. It doesn't necessarily require any vocal, but in worship, we should be praising God. That means doing it according to his will. If I play a, a piano during worship service today, I'm not bringing praise to God. I'm doing what I want to do. Praise has gotten it's getting twisted in entertainment these days. Yes, ma'am. That's right, without addition or subtraction in spirit and in truth. That's exactly right. That's why we have the Bible. You know, 2 Thessalonians 5 and 21 says, prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. There's only one way to do that. If we go, well, my opinion, your opinion, well, how can we say my opinion is better than your opinion? We can't, but we can look at it, prove it through God's word and say, where you say baptism is not essential, but I'm looking in here and says baptism doth now also save us. That proves that baptism is essential. It gets back to us knowing God's word. I love how uh, Paul, when he wrote Second Timothy, he said, uh, rightly divide the word of truth. That's the King James Version. And I love that because there's a whole lot of wrongly dividing. We have to rightly Remember when, uh, I think it's Matthew chapter four, when Jesus was, was tempted by Satan? Didn't Satan use Satan on him? I mean, didn't Satan use Satan on him? Didn't Satan try to use scripture on him? And that's what the world will do. But what did Jesus do? He put it back and he used the word, but he put it in context. There are people that can make the Bible sound beautiful. But is it in context? Is it mating scripture with scripture? You turn on a TBN sometime or turn on a, there's a guy named, I think his name is Tony Evans. Uh, it's beautiful lessons. Until it's time for salvation. Then it's like, ooh, and he pulls all these people in, but he won't give the full plan of salvation. And therein lies the problem. We have to stick to what the Bible says. It's not a matter of praying Christ into your heart. I don't care if you said 59 minutes of truth one minute of ask Christ into your heart, you just blown it. Because the Bible, clear, and I, it gets me because it's like, okay, how can you take time and know all of that? But you clearly miss salvation. That's so clear. It's because most of them were trained up under older 
mentors that believe that and they're just regurgitating that same knowledge. When I was in the Marine Corps, I had a chance to meet a guy. I thought he was amazing. He was a Greek scholar named Walter Martin. Wrote a lot of books for the religious world. And one day a person asked him, if you read Romans 6, Romans 6 tells you literally how to obey the gospel. And 1 Corinthians 15 defines what the gospel is. Can't get around that. And somebody asked him, he was debating with me. And so he asked Walter Martin, Mr. Martin, or Dr. Martin, what does Romans 6 have to do with 1 Corinthians 15? Guess what this so-called Greek scholar said? Absolutely nothing. And I couldn't get to him, so I just ended up leaving. I was like, wow, talk about misleading so many people. When you, it's, it makes it abundantly clear exactly how, if you get a chance, read 1 Corinthians 15, first four verses, then go back and read Romans 6. It's incredible how they mate together. It tells you how to obey, because when you tell somebody who doesn't know about the Bible, where to be saved, you have to obey the gospel. Okay, well, what is the gospel? The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So what do you think they're thinking? Well, how do I obey that? And what they often hear is you just ask Christ into your heart. No, Romans 6 tells you specifically. Let's, let's go and read Romans 6 in case you've never done it. How do you obey the gospel? Let's let the Bible tell me. <clears throat> I'm so glad the Holy Spirit made this clear. We'll do this quickly as a side note. Romans 6, starting at verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Remember, the gospel is death, burial, and resurrection, right? He's letting us know you're about to become dead to sin. How? And the second point is he doesn't want you to take it for granted. Just because grace covers sin doesn't mean you just keep sinning. No, that's a hard issue. But how are we obeying this gospel? Verse three is where it starts. Know ye not that so many of us as were, what is that? Baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. That's the first part of the gospel, the death of Christ, right? Look at this, verse four. Therefore we are buried. Uh-oh, now we got death and the burial. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead. What is that? That's a resurrection to me. From the dead by the glory of the Father, even so you should walk in newness of life. And you just keep going down and it gets even clearer and clearer. How could you say that has nothing to do with 1 Corinthians 15? Jeff's just saying you were taught something and you're just reteaching it without studying. That is so clear. But may we not get caught up in that. May we realize the goodness that we have in Christ and that we have the truth. And if we have the truth, we're all responsible for the truth. We have to teach people. Any questions or comments before we continue? Yes, Caroline. Yes. Yes. That's right, Caroline. That's right. That's right. I knew people that would visit around San Diego. They would drive around and try to find a quote unquote congregation. And it was all based on how good the music was. I was like, no, you're looking for a concert. You're looking for James Brown. He's performing next week. But we're, but we're... That's right, as long as you use your voice, you're good. You don't have... That's right. The Bible calls it the fruit of our lips. That's big to God, even if it doesn't sound good to us. And we'll try to take one more. 
verse 13 of Ephesians 1. It says, in whom ye also trusted, says, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and whom also that ye believed, ye were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Mm, let's go to Ephesians 4 and 30. Go ahead a few verses. Ephesians 4 and 30. What is this seal? Anybody know anything about the seal in the Old Testament the kings did? You're going to hear about it in the sermon today, especially during the, the Persian. Yes, sir. Seal, uh, you know that ownership. That's exactly right. And when you sealed it, it, it was considered that's as far as you could go. Now, what does the Holy Spirit do with that with us? Let's read Ephesians 4 and 30. It says, not yet, Ephesians 4 and 30, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. When you look up that word in the Greek that's sealed, it talks about an earnest. I wish I know Brother Steve checked out. I know he deals with this a lot in real estate. What's a, who can tell me an earnest payment? What does that imply? Or does it apply anything? Down payment. That's right, a down payment. And it's considered a considerable down payment because they expect you to come back to, to get the rest. If you buy a house and you put 30000 down, you think you're just going to roll off? I ain't worried about that. If you are, give me that 30000 No, when you put a serious amount down, that's implying you're coming back. You know what we get according to Acts 2 and 38? We get the earnest deposit of the what? The Holy Spirit, which is letting God know God has given us the best of himself, the Holy Spirit. So what is God implying? I'm coming back. Didn't Jesus say, I'm coming back to get you? I prepared a place for you. See, all these scriptures tie in together and is designed to strengthen our faith. The most precious thing God gave us and the water gave a baptism other than the forgiveness of sins. And he added us to the church, but he gave us the Holy Spirit. And it's an earnest deposit saying that he's coming back to Christ Jesus to get us. Are you ready? You ever had a mama say, I'm coming by when you want to go to Disney World or somewhere? Mama said, I'm coming by 4.30 to get you. You better be ready. That house better be clean. You better wash them dishes. And she pulls up, ain't none of them dishes clean. And you still in your pajamas? What do you think gonna happen? I'm going to get you. you ain't going. <laughs> That's right. Now, how do you think Christ feels when He's given His life and He comes back? And y'all know the phrase: "Heaven is a prepared place for a." None of y'all saw my notes, but you know that. That means we have to be ready. Then the Bible say, "What does thief in the night mean?" Charles. Never know when he's That's exactly right. You don't know when he's coming, but you know you're supposed to be ready. A thief is not going to call you and tell you, I'm getting ready to rob your house because you're getting ready to go to church. No, he's going to get you when you think you're not ready. Such is the case. When Christ comes back, he expects us to be ready because no man, and I'm amazed, the Bible makes this clear, but throughout the land and country, there are people that are claiming to know the second coming of Christ. And it's amazing how they keep pushing the date back. They're still getting money, but they keep pushing the date back. That's pure, full-blooded foolishness. You're just supposed to be ready. We're going to close out now. Let me pray. Our most gracious and heavenly Father, heavenly Father, we come to you, heavenly Father, thanking you for giving us this short time, heavenly Father, to dig into your word before our worship service. Help us as brethren to go to the back room and prepare and plan to conduct your worship service the way your word has told us to do so. Allow us to come back here before 10, 10 a.m., Heavenly Father, to conduct your worship service. Thank you for all who came and all who were involved. In your son Jesus' name, amen.